Thumbs up? No, there it is. Second one. All right. Amitofu to all of you. We will start our class with the four great vows. Bow. I vow to deliver innumerable sentient beings. I vow to cut off endless vexations. I vow to master limitless approaches to Dharma. I vow to attain Supreme Buddhahood. Okay. Good evening and good morning to some of you. Uh, hold on a second. Okay. And um, uh, we're going to continue on with Master Holmgren, and we're going to continue on where we left off uh, 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 last week, because this particular question that's here is a very vital question, and it shows a transition in the questions that were asked before, where these questions started from, let's say, basic, and then moved on to a um, uh, a profound, and now it's going into what you could consider an esoteric uh, or or secret meaning. And the term secret meaning is kind of like what esoteric is um, uh, translated in Chinese to be, but secret meaning that it is not readily um, apparent. It doesn't matter if somebody tells you what the secret meaning is, that doesn't mean that that's the secret meaning. And so there's no way that one can tell you something that you as a sentient being could interpret it. It requires a transcendence in, in, um, in one's understanding to a realization that is not a realization from the sentient side or from the sentient being or samsara, but it is a realization of mind itself and showing that the mind has turned itself inward to view the samsara. When it does that, when, when we talk about the mind turning itself inward, um, it's kind of like... It's kind of like this, where where the mind's eye is big, and this is really not not to scale. This is a very very small, infinitesimally small, and it is this understanding or realization of how small samsara is that makes the difference. Um, we're going to be going back to this page here and. Sentha has given you um, a, a link, so if you are so technically um, able, you can follow along with me um, with that. I don't know how that works, but um, perhaps another thing we can do is put it side by side to me uh, for those who are, aren't able to do that so that we can see um, that uh, because the words at this point are very, very uh, important in terms of not their significance, but what they are leading you to. And so um, it, it's important that we we're kind of all literally on the same page with this because I'm going to lend to you my skill so that you can look at it and and kind of work it yourself. And even before we started, um, Michael had a question right away that popped up from what from from what my notes were on there. And so he quite astutely picked up something in terms of this. So um, when we we see this, the, the question was, you say that the such like Buddha nature is embodied by both sentient beings and the Buddhas identically. So this is down below the green line is where we're at. Thank you very much. Um, and it says, um, 
identically and without duality. So this is quite a bit already in the question. It's saying that the, the Dharma nature is embodied by both sentient beings and Buddhas identically and without duality. So this is very interesting because this shows where we're what we're looking at and and what the sutras say that the mind of the buddha is the mind of the sentient beings and vice versa there is no other mind and and when we look at it then we have to say okay well what is this then is it the mind of the sentient being that's there why do they say this in this way does that really mean and validate that the sentient mind is is also a buddha mind but then you look at it and it says identically and without duality so this is something that's saying how is this that it's identical and without duality but then we say that the sentient beings are illusory so is it the sentient being mind that is identical with the with the buddha mind um if that sentient mind is illusory or is it something else so this is already where the question is going here going well this looks kind of like you're talking about the same thing sometimes you might say it's a wobbler kind of saying well you know you're kind of not really saying it this way or that way how can that be okay how can that be that doesn't make sense in terms of reason and looking at things it doesn't make sense so then we get to the next line and in the next line it says therefore if one group is diluted or diluted diluted excuse me um is diluted um both should be diluted if one group is enlightened both should be enlightened so the argument here is that if that's the case then the sentient mind should be enlightened why isn't it why why are sentient beings limited in in their um in their scope and abilities where the the buddhas are not and then it says um why only buddhas enlightened while the sentient beings are diluted. So this is a very important question because it's asking, what is this sentient mind? Is there a mind of a sentient being that is different from the mind of the Buddha? Because if we say the Buddha mind is, is, is not diluted and it's equal to that, it should be A is equal to B, B is equal to C, so A is equal to C. And where C is, is uh, illumination. But when we look at those things, it doesn't really work that way. And we say, no, but this is an, an illusory sentient being. So it's a puzzle in terms of it. And if somebody asks you, how would you respond to them in terms of it this is now going into the very deep and profound and beyond and beyond the profound i was speaking earlier there's three um channels that come through in any buddha dharma the first one is basic cable which is just you just get a basic message and then you get a profound one which enables one to obtain realizations and a deeper more profound uh, understanding and then the third is the esoteric which is beyond words and phrases and it is something that is realized by sincerely investigating and contemplating the question and and the question here is that if they're the same why why do sentient beings then are not in, able to enjoy the same benefits as a Buddha. And so when we look at the answer to it, um, we see, and it said, um, at this point, 
we enter the inconceivable portion of the teaching. We talked about this last week. This is something cannot be understood by the ordinary mind. All right. So what, what are they referring to here as the ordinary mind? Um, and and we'll continue reading, but we're, we'll come back because we have to resolve what this ordinary mind is. One becomes enlightened by discerning the mind. So it's saying one becomes enlightened by discerning the mind. One is deluded because of losing awareness of the true nature. If the conditions necessary for you to understand this occur, then they occur. That's Pratika Samapada. It cannot be definitely explained. Simply rely on the ultimate truth and maintain awareness of your own true mind. So here they're talking about awareness, which is what I always am talking about. I don't know how many years I've been talking about awareness of mind. Why do I do that? Because it shows up everywhere, whether it's a sutra or it's in the treatises, they're always talking about awareness. If you don't get this part, you're not in right view. It is in right view that one practices mind and does not try to practice cultivating or polishing this ordinary mind. And yet some of the sutras say, and, and I will even say, it, the ordinary mind is Buddha. And then you scratch your head and say, well, what the heck are you talking about? How can it be the ordinary mind is Buddha? But when we say that that's not really the Buddha, I don't understand that. It cannot be understood by the ordinary mind. Again, we go back to where it says at this point, we enter the inconceivable portion of this teaching. It cannot be precisely explained. It is something, this food for contemplation, that you have to really work at. You have to really look at this. And if you do this in a sincere way, it can lead to a realization. But if you just simply gloss over it and say, yes, yes, I, okay. And then someone like me comes along and says, can you explain this to me? And you go, uh, no, but it sounds really good. We're not grading you on what something sounds good or doesn't sound good. Um, it, um, it is not in this way that one realizes it. it has to be something that is, causes you to be uneasy, unsteady on your feet, troublesome, worrisome. Because it's going to your very perceived existence. And you want to know it, but then you don't want to know it because you, it, it's like uh, being right at ground zero where something appears like it's going to crush you. And you don't understand this. And it isn't necessarily that it's going to crush you. It's going to absorb you. So that's a little bit better way of looking at it. Just allow yourself to be absorbed. But even that to some of you might be a little bit scary. But it's okay because it doesn't matter what you think is an absorption. Is there's no absorption. And, and the reason there's no absorption is because you are already absorbed. You just are walking around thinking that you're an individual ego, life and being, uh, or a personality separate and apart from others. And as a result of that, that's what it's saying. One is deluded because of losing awareness of the true nature. The true nature is originally, there is no such thing. Originally, it's all mine. That's what Hui Neng taught. So when we're looking at this, Hui Neng is just simply passing on what 
the uh, mind to mind transmission of Holmgren was it is just in this way. But this is not easy for us to look at and to see. But we have to do this. We can't move on. No matter how much I want to turn the page, I should not turn that page because I have not resolved what's on this particular page. And we, we have to look at that and say, there is a lot going on in this answer, a lot. But we are lost in it because we've lost our awareness of the, the true nature. If we turn the mind's eye uh, inward, and again, it's, it is in this way, where this large eye is looking at this infinitesimally small aspect of mind, then it helps us understand more. But when we're looking at it from this little speck, this mode of dust, and this mode of dust is trying to fathom the universe, it is, it is so difficult for us to do that because we, we are the creation, not the creator. And yet the creator is not a separate life and being, is not a thing, is not a God. This is sometimes very difficult to explain to Christians because Christians only have the orientation of, of, uh, of uh, that there is a supreme being. But we do not see it in this way that there is a supreme being. We see it in the way that it is mind. And in this mind permeates everything. It is the, the emptiness of all phenomena simply because it all belongs to mind. And so we begin to start looking at this and, and factoring in this into our contemplation so that we're able to kind of try to penetrate it more. And so then it says, uh, and when it says if the conditions are there that are uh, necessary for you to understand, then this will happen. But you have to make those conditions. You have to make the conditions. How do you make them? Is by the contemplation of this, this deep, profound contemplation that you see in this way that everything is is clear you have seen that that all of these things are appearances appearances in mind and there is not this ordinary mind but yet mind is just ordinary and mundane and you go how do i reconcile what appears to be a contradiction that you just said it doesn't make sense only can be reconciled if we look directly into it and we see that there's this non-duality which he he brings up and in the question and we see that it's identical it's identical and that's why there is this emptiness the thing about the question as it's going through it is is that that which believes to be a, a, a sentient being is just simply a manifestation in mind itself. There's no duality there. It, it is not separate. And so when we look at this, we see that uh, it says, uh, simply rely on the ultimate truth and maintain awareness of your own true mind. So what is this? This is something that Michael had a question about because I put a question mark there. Thank you. Um, and, and if you look at the very, very last sentence there, and it's saying simply rely on the ultimate truth and maintain awareness of your own true mind. And you see, I put a question mark there. Um, and so, so it it's a, something saying that is there this own true mind? What is the own? Michael, do you have an answer for that? <laughs> okay. Um, well, it depends on 
from which side you look at it. And it depends also on whether you have the understanding of this or not. Unless you you don't have the understanding, then the own is uh, misleading because there's no such thing as your own true mind. Once you circle through it and return back, then it makes sense. And then you can indeed talk about the own true mind because the own is just is already absorbed in the true mind it's just a convenient way of talking um this would be my answer okay thank you very much when you look at this let's go back to the because this is how i penetrate these teachings or quote unquote teachings so it says simply so it's saying let's back this off and this is sim simply, don't make it complicated. Rely. What are you relying on? So you're relying on the ultimate truth. What is the ultimate truth? Michael, what is the ultimate truth? Mind. And anybody want to add a little bit more to that? Uh, please uh, raise your hand to be unmuted. Can you see the other people? If they raise your hand, nobody wants to raise your hand. Simon says, raise your hand. Everything is created by the mind. There you go. So this is important. So this ultimate truth is that everything is created by the mind. So we start simply rely on this. How many times I, have I said that during all this time period? Everything is created by the mind. And so this is the ultimate truth. So if we have this ultimate truth, it says you start with that. That is your foundation. That, that is your bridge to the esoteric. And then from there, what it says is maintain awareness okay of your own true mind now this could be read in a very mistaken way thinking well gilbert has his own true mind i'll make i'll maintain my awareness of my own true mind but it doesn't say that really it doesn't say that what it says is the own is mind itself just mind that is what is what is real that what you can rely on is that everything is created by the mind so when we maintain awareness of our own true mind we're aware moment to moment to moment that everything that manifests whether it's by form sensation perception volition or consciousness has been created by the mind everything every moment you see this you see that it is not something that is um uh is separate there's no duality there so when they're saying simply rely on the ultimate truth maintain awareness of your own true mind it's just saying turn the mind's eye inward understanding that everything is created by the mind this is the own the own is we miss that and we 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 begin to think that it is us that are turning our mind's eye around this was ananda's mistake in the shurangama sutra until the buddha finally yelled at him and said ananda that's not your mind that's not what you're talking about that's not your own true mind that is an appearance your own true mind is inconceivable. That's why they say at this point we enter the inconceivable portion of the teaching because you have to rely on your faith. You have to rely on the faith that this ultimate truth that everything is created by the mind. So, so you know, if Michael says mind and Eon says everything's created by the mind, it's the same thing. As long as we understand that that in mind is incorporated, the understanding that everything is created by it. So there is not this duality there. 
that we are looking at. And so the question is one that's asked from the samsaric side and saying, why does this appear to be um, uh, inequitable that we have to suffer and the Buddhas are free to party? But they don't understand that the liberation is already there. The idea of a life in being is a dream. And so we don't see that. And so because of that, we artificially create this idea of a duality, but it only occurs in a dream. It doesn't occur anywhere else. Outside the dream, the Buddha is the Buddha. And the Buddha is the Buddha when the Buddha doesn't think the Buddha is a Buddha. It just is the suchness of everything where we go to the Tathagata Garbha, the, the, the Buddha womb in which all appearances are brought forth from, not from your mind as an individual or an ego or whatever. That is illusory. So it is something that we have to be able to begin to focus on to do this. If you read this and you pass up on this, you miss this, the profound, and, and knowing the profound, you miss the opportunity to, to experience the esoteric, to experience this reversal of the mind's eye so one can see clearly. When there is a reversal there, even for a moment, there is a liberation. The liberation of being free from the samsaric limitations of mind. This mind that you have is the very mind of the Buddha, but it does not belong to you as an individual. It is the Buddha mind. And that therein lies the problem. Okay, so we go on to the next page. I can see this is going to take a while <laughs> to go through this because I have several pages of of this. Uh, let me see. Uh, my next page is three out of five. If you can find three out of five, hopefully you. It starts with therefore. Because you may be on part two. I'm, I apologize to you. I kind of threw up that stuff all together. It Keep going. If anybody sees up, oh, we lost it. So are you, you still working on it? All right. It starts with therefore, uh, Villa McCritty Sutra. And again, I apologize because I send it over and I lost track of when I was doing it. So I sent it to them out of order. But this part starts, therefore, the Vilamakriti Sutra says, dharmas have no self-nature. Dharmas here are phenomena and no other nature. So this is interesting because this comes on the heels of where it said, maintain awareness of your own true mind. And so... This is Holmgren doing this incredible clarification that comes up because people would be trapped and say, oh, that's my own true mind. No, Ananda, that's not your mind. That's the Buddha mind. And so here he's saying dharmas. And, and why he's saying that is that to, so that one can use their own discernment to recognize that, that what is arising is phenomenal and that has does not have a a self nature it appears in accordance in, in harmony with the self nature of mind but in and of itself it does not have a self nature or what they say and no other nature this is very important too because it is this all-inclusiveness of emptiness that is being addressed here, saying it is not 
outside of the self nature of mind. It is, it is part of the self nature of mind, but it does not independently have a self nature. So that is why one cannot use and call it my own mind. It is the Buddha mind. And so as we're seeing that, oh, great. Um, when we, we look at it, then that's important because it goes back to the last sentence and it's showing clearly that um, that it is not um, it is not an other nature or doesn't have the self nature because if it was then the dharmas of that uh, the appearance of what appears to be a life and being an ego or personality is is uh, neither existent nor non-existent it belongs to the self nature of mind but it does not have an independent self nature we continue on and it says the dharmas were fundamentally not generated in the first place and are not now extinguished so it's saying these fundamentally are not generated in the first place this is very kind of quizzical because you're saying well then why why are they there it is an appearance and and the sutras often talk about appearances especially uh those involving manjusri and we're looking at things and we're seeing that there's this appearance that's there and so when they're saying not generated is kind of like saying it doesn't have its own existence and and are not now extinguished meaning that that it is if one is to look at everything going back to this sorry i'm jumping around going back to here and, and just imagining this is this is infinitesimally small it we're looking at it in the proper perspective in terms of how how things appear in mind and but those things are not things of any particular um dimension because they're they're appearing in mind they're beyond spatial dimension or temporal uh time time uh considerations um they're just simply there but they're not extinguished because they they are part of mind where would they go and that's why they're saying there's no other nature there's no other nature where something that's illusory would go to that which is illusory is precisely appearing in mind and that which is illusory includes your idea of an ego or a life and being or a personality that you believe that you're using when you turn the mind's eye inward thank you asanta you doing a very good job with this when you turn the mind's eye inward then voila there it is it it everything is perfectly in its place nothing is out of place this is appearing because of causes and conditions and as we begin to see these things what's the the part that's the most important is it's not nihilistic it is not something that is is not now ex extinguished if it was extinguished it would be nihilistic but it's not it doesn't need to be extinguished it is just part of mind where did it go where did the ducks go from Baizong and matsu where indeed would they go it's all in mind it's there in fact it's all, always been there always will be no and just as i reference them they're there Baizong's ducks flying from mind to mind it's just in this way when we look at this then all of this dharma comes alive it no longer is two-dimensional no longer even three-dimensional it's beyond dimensions it is instantaneous and when it's seen it's seen clearly maybe it'll get fuzzy fairly quickly uh but nevertheless you realized it you saw something that was not part of samsara was that does not follow the rules of samsara beyond the rules of samsara 
So this is how we're looking at this to try to 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 really penetrate these. This is something that is is quite important. So then the next part says enlightenment is to transcend the two extremes and enter into non-discriminating wisdom. So this transcendence um, of the two extremes is one of them is that everything is permanent, everything is real. And no, sorry, Putra, everything is empty. The other extreme is nihilistic. Emptiness does not mean emptiness of, of anything. It, it is more, we, we should call it all inclusive. It's all part of mine. It's all there. All of the defilements, all of the dreams, all the illusions, they're appearing in mind. We don't understand that because we are trying to solve the problem from the outlook of a life and being. Um, and it doesn't work that way. We have to turn the mind's eye inward and look at the notion of ourselves as a creation of mind. This, again, is inconceivable to do from the samsaric side. It requires faith and an understanding of this profoundness and what he was mentioning here, non-discriminating wisdom. So the non-discriminating wisdom is this wisdom that sees everything precisely as it is appearing and precisely in accordance with Pratika Samapada, causes and conditions never fail. Everything that is manifesting from one moment to another is Pratika Samapada. There's not one space or gap between that, between a, a thought and no thought that is non-existent. Even if one is not thinking, nevertheless, mind awareness is there. Sometimes when we use our meditation, we're grasping at thinking, grasping at sounds, grasping at form, grasping at appearances. And we we believe when the mind is not thinking, then that's not it. But the mind, irregardless of whether something is appearing in it, or not appearing in it, the mind is still present. Um, the ancients used to refer to it as a bhavanga consciousness, this kind of a, let's say, an amplifier that's on, but is not receiving any signal to amplify. But nevertheless, it's there. And when we see things in this way, it is that there's no gap at all between any phenomena, any space, there is no space. It is all mind. If we call it space, it's a uh, um, conceptual idea between two phenomenal appearances, but the space itself is also a phenomenal appearance in terms of us thinking that this is a space between two objects, when in fact there's nothing that's that's separate them one iota. It is just in this way. As we begin to look at this and we bang and bang and bang against it, we can break down what they call these these giant metal um, or walls that confine us and break break them down so that so that the, the mind can expand naturally to its full potential rather than being confined in this uh, this dream state that what we believe to be has some form of order and natural order to it in terms of things that are happening. We look at our watch, we can tell the time, we know we're getting older, we've got all the sequential stuff, and therefore we believe it's real. But clinging to that will guarantee us to die and be born again to start the whole process over rather than looking at it and saying, 
there is a choice here if one chooses the Buddha one does not have to to come back to this world unless one chooses to fulfill the vows but at that point one is aware what they're doing in in this world or they can become aware in a lifetime of what they're doing in the world and 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 fulfill their vows they then have a choice at the end of this life where they will go to next and where we we go to next it just depends on what we want to do in terms of our vow in terms of where we can place place ourselves when i say ourselves is place the fulfillment of the vow okay what time do we have uh, i'm not seeing a sorry i'm not seeing a clock on my thing what time is it right now 6 42 okay so i got time great we continue on um we'll get through at least one question uh response um if you can understand this doctrine then during all of your activities you should simply maintain awareness of your fundam fundamental pure mind so the first part is this understanding of the doctrine and so the doctrine again is that everything is created by the mind that there is not a duality here that we're talking about there's no extremes of real and not real that everything belongs to mind and using this non-discriminating wisdom, we see appearances for what they are. So when we do this, now they're talking about how to practice. So he says, if you understand this part, then during all of your activities, you should simply maintain awareness of your fundamental pure mind. So how do we maintain awareness of our fundamental pure mind is by just doing that just being aware constantly bringing the mind back to the present moment being aware of what is arising in the mind knowing that whatever is arising in the mind is an illusion but the illusion is based on the fact that everything's created by the mind so imagine this now if you come to a realization that everything is created by the mind and that's what's there using your vows what could you do in this world if everything's created by the mind you can change people's lives you can help them in samsara relieve their suffering but even more so than that like the Diamond Sutra says, is by presenting to them the escape, the transcendence from coming out of the dream. And that's more precious than anything that one could possibly conceive of giving to the poor or giving to somebody that's needy when you're giving them liberation. It's like somebody who's who's in in prison. Let's take uh, somebody um, that is, let's say, a um, a person from from a, a drug lord, and a drug lord's in prison, and you give him the option: you can stay in prison, and we will give you all of these things we'll give you a stake and we'll do this because he has his influence to do that and we will do all the stuff you know um but you cannot leave yourself or you can put all of that stuff aside and you can walk out of here but you can't take anything with you which one do you think they would choose even somebody as as um unwise as a drug lord would choose freedom wouldn't you think they would they would want to to remove themselves from this 
prison because at this point it's a self-imposed prison if one offers them this freedom. That's you. The mind is trapped in this self-imposed prison that doesn't have to be there. In one moment, in the snap of the fingers, you can jump out of it. The funny thing is because of your vows, you go back into it because that's where you do work, because you understand. You understand this. But nevertheless, you can, you can, you can get out. That's what's important, is that you understand that. I once had a dog um, a long time ago, an Airedale, and um, and she, she was very clever, and she learned how to unlatch the gate to um, to the um, to to go out. And she was also clever enough not to let my other dog go out, so she locked the door behind her. And then when I came home, she was sitting on my porch waiting for me. Ta-da, look what I did. I'm out. Don't worry about the other one. He's still in there, you know. But she chose to get out. And But she didn't have to go anywhere. She just stayed there. She just, because that was her choice. She She understood, okay, well, this is where I need to be. This is where I'm going to get fed, you know, and this is where I sleep and everything else. I just want the feeling that I can stay or go. Not bad, right? So, you know, does a dog have a Buddha nature? No. So it's very interesting when we look at this and see, you know, hopefully you can be, you know, as smart as my, my dog. No, and, and find the way out. But then when you get out, don't try to go, well, I'm leaving, I'm gone here, I'm, I don't want to come back or whatever. You, you understand the more profound um, dharma is, is when you truly understand that you, um, what you're doing. This is liberation. Believe me, it's liberation. When you understand what you're doing here and, and how you can help other people. My goodness. I mean, it gives you this purpose in your life to remove suffering from sentient beings. We don't have to go to the pure land. We make the pure land here. We try to do things because we, we see it in this way. We create this kind of an activity. Today, my office said something to me that was very touching. Because during the time when I was ill and I was really down, down and and I was in peril of losing my business, they stood behind me. They 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 protected me. They they kept my business going, and they said, "We did that because you are a good person, and and we wanted to help you." You're always helping people. Wherever you go, you're always helping people. And you're a good person. So why shouldn't we help you back? This is creating a pure land on earth. Even if it's a little mini one, I'll pat myself on the back. But it, it isn't in this way. It is just what we do and how we transform this world, even if it's just a slight amount. But it shows a potentiality. And it showed me, yeah, I'm... I'm on the right track because I don't ever think about it that way. I'm a good person or I'm a bad person. I just do what I can. And sometimes I feel like I'm a rubber man that's being stretched in so many different directions and, and attentions, you know. Um, and, but I, I do my best. I really try to do that. And that's our practice. That's our practice. It's simple. And, and we can get to that. You are right there right now looking at this. You have the ability to step out of samsara, even if you could only step out with one foot of samsara. And you can straddle samsara and mind. You see, they're not two. They're just one. And when you look at things in this way, it changes everything. 
You can do that. Just because you've been listening and listening and listening, you have this potential. I really want you to excel. I want you to 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 listen very carefully. This is why I'm going over this and showing you how deep this Dharma is, how incredibly deep. And we read it and we go through it. Last uh, week after I read it, I wasn't satisfied. I felt like I just glossed over it. And to some of you, it just went over your head. But taking the time to go slowly through this, it enables you to see clearly. You see this and you, you begin to, to do this where uh, you have this idea of, of uh, simply maintaining awareness of your fundamental pure mind. It, and it says, the next lines, we can go back to that. Do this constantly and fix, fixedly um, without generating false thought or illusion of personal possession. This is very, very important here, where it's saying that it has to be done continuously, because this is what I always tell you in terms of meditation, it has to be continuous, but in your daily practice, this awareness of the mind has to be continuous and fixed. So I, I put here, as you see, it's continuous when it says constantly, it's continuous and fixedly is the concentration has to be there. So you have to maintain this concentration there, the right concentration. You do not stress yourself to concentrate. What you do is you just hold it like this, hold the present moment so ever so slightly and subtly, sublimely, holding the present moment. It is truly sublime if you can do that. You're not trying to, to uh, create something, you know, in some sorrow with it. You're just holding and, and let the mind, the mind's own wisdom, uh, generate the, um, the wisdom that you need, the Anyatara Samyak Sambodhi. That's why it says, without generating false thought, Okay, so you don't generate false thought. Every time you have a thought that is a clinging thought, is a discrimination or a vexation, you are generating an, an energy that will ensure that that will appear again and again, simply because you're putting that into mind. But when you have this maintaining of the awareness of mind with this non-discriminating wisdom, then you're not generating those false thoughts. And after a while, they begin to fall away. I've seen this in you. I've seen this in so many of you. Uh, it, it, it truly, truly touches my heart, especially in this last retreat. I saw so many participants and I saw them where they're no longer generating these false thoughts. And, and in that moment, they are the purest of beings so incredibly pure. I wish that you could see what I could see in you, this pure light that you're manifesting in that moment. And that's why it's saying, or the illusion of personal possession, the moment you think that you have something, my problem, my car, my house, my wife, my husband, my dog, my cat, whatever, it's a personal possession then you um, you move further away from it. It doesn't mean you have to to renounce everything in this lifetime. You have to put it in in the due perspective of what you you can do and what you can't do. So it's all right, you know, little by little. But you understand the more you cling to something, the more you will suffer. It doesn't matter what it is. If you cling to your husband, your wife, your children, your job, whatever moments taken away from you, you're going to suffer, or will you, depending on what happens, if you're clear about it. But this is our practice. And then the next sentence is, enlightenment will thus occur of itself or by itself. So this enlightenment will naturally happen simply because you take away these false thoughts, the mind is clear clear about what it is seeing. And so 
when we when we see things in this way it's it's telling you you don't have to seek there's no attaining this mind is natural everything uh, happens in a natural way and that's what's important to us is when we see this and everything happens in a natural way so we get to the next part if you ask a lot of questions the number of doctrinal questions will become greater and greater if you want to understand the essential point of buddhism then beware of maintaining awareness is paramount and so the first thing is there's a story of of uh, master shen yang shifu when he uh had the the good fortune to to uh stay overnight at one um one temple and there was also this very great master staying th that night so shifu he kept asking him questions and what about this and why does it say this and what does it mean by your own mind or whatever he just went on and on for for quite a while he said for several hours just asking the questions and the master was just sitting there and he would say anymore and then he said yes and this and this and this master would say anymore he never responded to him he just was just going anymore anymore finally shifu was exhausted he, he he had asked so many questions and the the master just went put down and in that moment it just shattered shifu's world it shattered the idea of the samsaric existence and he he no longer had all of these questions that were welling up inside of him they just all collapsed and shattered each question was the same question in any case questioning whether or not something is mind or samsara and so um so that's why when we ask the questions they'll be more and more it's just like the huato it's okay you can have the questions ask the question ask and ask and ask and keep asking the questions don't be afraid of the questions be afraid that you you lose your energy to ask the questions to look into and to contemplate and when you do that after all that then you understand what's paramount is maintaining this awareness of the mind um, that's what's the most important so you have to be aware the essential point in buddhism is that it is what shakamuni buddha did under the bodhi tree he became aware of mind he was observing it he was seeing all the fallacies all the weaknesses all the illusions of holding on to the mind he never had experienced that before he was starving he he was depriving him himself of all these things thinking that was the way to do that when and all he had to do is just simply choose the buddha mind moment to moment and not fall into illusions and that's why he it says here just simply maintain the awareness of the fundamental pure mind and if you can do that you are not far from the the buddhas and the patriarchs we're going to stop there and we will um uh pick up from there with the maintaining awareness the number one um because um there's a lot still to be talked about so don't miss next week if you miss it make sure you you go to the stuff i wow i stopped right on time <laughs> so that's good so in any case there's there's quite a bit here and forgive my exhortations to you and uh, but i i truly want you to to um to realize mind and, and if you can do that it it is something incredible and i know a lot of you already already have realized mind um some of you maybe need a certificate or something you know a pencil that said you know uh, i climbed the mountain or whatever you know but um I'm sure you can get one online if you want. Uh, but in, in any case, 
you know, just be true. Be true to mine, not to yourself, but don't let yourself down. Yourself is a self nature of mine, not you. And so that's what's important. Okay. So that's where we're at. Um, I really want to thank again, Michael and, and Sentha for uh, helping put together the stuff that we were doing and, and putting together. Yeah, there's, I don't think it's that easy to kind of coordinate all of this stuff, especially when I gave it to them like a shuffle deck of cards. But it is important that, that you have a chance to, to read, um, read this on your own and follow along. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not one for PowerPoints, but PowerPoints aren't, this is truly what I would call a PowerPoint, okay? This is a PowerPoint. And the PowerPoint is, is that you're seeing the tip of my finger from the viewpoint of the Buddha mind, okay? So thank you. All right, we'll entertain questions now. No questions. You guys completely understood everything. Okay, Michael, go ahead. It's a question I already asked uh, at a previous occasion. Uh, when I when the translation is so precise that it's incredible to believe how precise. And uh, when you reflect how about how easy it would be to mess it up. So what does it say about the inside of the translator? Or what is the mechanism which guarantees the, uh, the coherence of the, of the wisdom here? Is this just the translator or is it bigger than this? It's from the mind, from the heart. Um, it, it doesn't matter. I can have different translations of this unless they're doctrinally, you know, in error of that, it doesn't matter. Um, one will pick up the essence of what was written, irregardless of the artfulness or inartfulness of the translator. And people get stuck on, oh, it didn't mean this, it mean, meant this or whatever, you know. And um, there's one of you that's in a, many translating groups and different groups, and they get caught up with this, how many, um, you know, angels can balance on a point of a pen. But Michael, you're, you're you're correct in looking at this in the right way, which is that you have to view it from the heart and see it from the heart. It is not in the words. It is in what, what I read and what I translate is the heart of the author, of the lecturer, of the speaker. And that's what's important. So you just simply use this as a schematic to try to, to get to that part. So we see the schematic, but in the, in the basic teaching, you don't even see the schematic. You only see the schematic in the profound, but in the, in the esoteric, we see the flow. We see the flow through all of it. And we're clear about that. We, we are clear from our own mind with the own in quotes. Okay, so it is something that, you know, people really can get very stuck on the translations, you know, of course, some translations are better. And sometimes scholastically, they'll say, well, this guy didn't do this well, or this one was better or whatever. It doesn't matter to me. I mean, sometimes I'll do it and I'll point out this was not done right or whatever, if it if it changes the meanings of it dramatically. But it's not in that what I, in, in my presentation, my presentation is the heart and the heart of what is being presented. And, and that's the most important aspect of it. You know, you cannot go wrong with that. You know that because everything else pours into it. All the sutras you've read, all the other treatises, they're all coming in and, and kind of self-leveling everything that's there. So that so so it makes it easier for you because that's kind of where you're at. That is what he was saying about that you have to develop this foundation. When you have the foundation, then it doesn't matter what's there. If something's a little bit off, you self-level it. 
by by your own wisdom okay so that's something future for future presenters to to know okay good question david oh you're hold on you have to unmute yourself okay there you go thank you uh, very much uh, for your talk um i've been um going back and his and you're or going back in time to um 2012 and going through your presentations and you've had you're talking very much about um self nature and everything and i was beginning to follow all that um but my question is it says here it mentions other nature could, could you explain what that term is supposed to mean or well absolutely um um i will i'll explain it by a story and, and this is story number 27 you guys have heard so many times but it's a good way to explain it to you uh once shifu was at, at a retreat and he had uh he was saying imagine you have this 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 porcelain dish and when you have this dish it has a lot of sand on it or dust it has a lot of dust on it and and when you when you see it there you know the practice is just simply blowing the dust off oh and i see so he said how how do you like my analogy and i'll make a long story short and i i raised up my hand and said shifu i was just wondering where did the dust go and and so um the point here i'm, I'm not going to tell the whole story over it too much i mean use it in some retreat someday again but in any case it was where did the dust go essentially meaning that this there is no other nature where the dust goes okay even if you swept it under the carpet it's still in mind no, I see. okay the that dust belongs to mind created by mind and so so this is not the way we that's the shen shu way of doing it but the the sudden way of doing it is seeing clearly that that the bowl and the dust are not separate so when they're saying that there is no, there is no other nature meaning there's nothing apart from mind that is why emptiness works because it's all inclusive and so I, you know, I've been going on for a while now talking about emptiness as being all inclusive because I believe that helps people understand more what emptiness is versus saying it's all empty. You know, there's nothing there. It's like, you know, um, light years and light years of empty space. It's not in that way. Okay. So that, so the other nature is non-existent, non but it's not it's just an it's just a notion but it, it has nothing to do with the ultimate reality of things okay okay by your okay. by our creation of other nature it's created in mind but it's not a, it's not a thing it's just an appearance in mind for temporarily for explanation okay, okay? Yep. any other questions No questions? I'm surprised. Ching. There you go. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Gilbert. Uh, my question is, um, what are the differences of um, Buddha mind and the Buddha nature? What are the differences of Buddha mind and the Buddha nature? Um, letters? um other than that uh that would be a, a samsara distinction but there's there's no difference so it's the same thing actually that means the same thing whether we say buddha buddha mind buddha nature uh pratika samapada um all of those things are just mind uh and we use the word mind but you know um because it's just harder to say well it's uh you know the tathagata or the um tathagata garba the, the the buddha womb but i just refer to mind as everything okay 
And that's the difficulty with people that are novices that are coming in and they don't understand this. And we've got to help them. We've got to say, no, this is not, don't mix consciousness and mind and try to, to do these things. You know, you're not going to get there. If you're teaching the people how to meditate, tell them to look at into mind and show them the right way, right from the beginning. What use is it if you're going to be sending them there and saying, okay, you know, just sit there and, you know, stop your mind from thinking. That's ridiculous. It's not the right way. It It, it is, to me, it, it, it just foolishness to do that when 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 somebody is given the right view from the very beginning they excel i mean they jump far i mean you know you take somebody like david mango you know who asks these questions he's asking and asking that's why he's starting to get it i mean he he's just a baby in terms of chan but his questions indicate that he's contemplating he's thinking about it no, far beyond somebody that would be sitting and going to retreats and crossing their legs. And so that's very, very important. So it's all mine. It's all mine. And no mine. Okay. Wei Shang, you're still here. We have to unmute them. Uh, Gilbert, um, you equate uh, mind to per, per, particular mm -hmm. samabada. Um, uh, my question is, I, I, I think um, I learned particular samabada only apply to the apparent reality. It does not apply to absolute reality. Aha. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I, but, uh, the, the, uh, uh, yeah, it, but why you say pretty because some about it is mine if it only applied to apparent reality? What is applying it? What is pl applying causes and conditions never fail? Mind. There you go. Okay. It's not two things. The the um, oh. <laughs> you okay. see that's why I'm laughing because I already know what it's going to hit you. It's not two things. It is mine. Now take this and contemplate it, and it will it will really it, it's going to be amazing what it does to you. That's why I was laughing. I'm I'm so happy that you asked that question because it was a sincere question and you're looking at it. I've had the question too. And and but it but it's good. It's just this way of mind. So so in its mind, all of all of that is the rules of mind. What do we call our forum? Mind work. We call it mind work because that's how mind works. Causes and condition never fail. It is what Shakyamuni Buddha realized under the Bodhi tree that everything was dependently originated. The 12 Nadanas. That's why he taught that first, because that is Pratika Samapada. And so when we understand that, then, then everything is clear. You just look every moment, moment to moment to moment. You have this awareness that whatever is appearing is appearing because of Pratika Samapada. You're using mind to look at mind, to create mind. So you're using the mind to create. What are you creating? You know, do you create a mess at work or do you create a pure land? Do you create a loving environment or a hateful environment? Every moment the choice is there. Why? Because you have faith in Pratika Samapada. You're using this mind. Little by little, that mind will just simply just shine through any false appearances of samsara. It's still here. The fan above me still whizzing around, you know, but I know that it's a dream. And it's clear. It's temporary. 
But this mind that is aware of all of this, that is setting all this into motion, has never been born, never been created. It is what uh, causes Pratika Samapada to work. It is precisely in this way. That's why the, um, he said, sorry, Putra, form is not other than emptiness. It's precisely this way. So when we see that, that gives us a big clue as to how to um, approach the, um, the practice in moment to moment. You got it now. I, I, I think. Uh, there's a related question to that. Don't think um, and you'll disappear. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's why I have questions. Um, the, 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 the other one, I think I learned either from your transcript or, or your video, is related to this. I, I really like that. It. It's uh, about, I, I, I'm afraid I'll paraphrase it wrong. Is you said the bodhicitta is is what's the word? It's beyond cause and condition. I think uh, Hua Yanjing has that too. I'm not sure. It's the 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 the, the bodhicitta vow is it's not subject to cause and condition. Something like that. I I cannot. Did I confuse you? I would say that the, the, the bodhicitta vow is in harmony with causes and conditions. Um, and, and seeing it in this way, because I don't want to become a wild fox. Um, so, so if you look at it in this way, contemplate that and look at it in this way and, um, and then if you find the exact quote and bring it next week. I, 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 I will. We'll I'll take try. a look at it because I don't want to go based on that. Like I say, that that's just the one in which the the one master lived thousands of lifetimes as a fox because he said that he gave the wrong answer that the Buddha was not subject to. Uh, the uh, no, that's that, that that's why I was afraid to ask this question. Yes. Okay. No, it's Thank okay. you. I, I'll I'll, I'll try to. I'll try to find it, and uh, I'll bring. Uh, if I find it, I'll, I'll bring it up uh, for the next. No class. problem. You you can ask the questions if you say it as a statement that's there. You know, um, it, then well, you're only going to be coming back as like a turtle for a hundred years for that one. <laughs> if you say five Our Fathers and ten Hail Marys, that'll cut it down a little bit. <laughs> you're all right. Don't worry. <laughs> Thank you. That's my Catholic coming out in me. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any, any questions? We still have time for questions. Nobody have questions? Letty, you haven't asked a question in a long time. <laughs> or Debbie. No more questions? All right, I probably burn you guys out. I really hope that, that you got something out of it. Um, um, I got quite a bit out of it. And so if you, if you practice sincerely, you will see that, that the, there is a, a great zeal for passing this on to others. And, and today the cause and conditions lined up right for me to try to use some, uh, more exhortations to try to get you to do this but i i hope you contemplate this during this week so that when you come back uh it it gets deeper believe it or not but you're gonna hang in there with me you know we're we're straddling between the profound and the um the esoteric and some of you are kind of jumping in and out and going is that what what and then and that's the esoteric jumping in so don't be afraid of it Okay. And uh, so hopefully, um, you know, next week you'll be all ready for the round two of this. But I'm, I'm very um, uh, so happy to, to present this to you. Sometimes there's things that come around that um, are special. And this, is, this particular part is incredibly special. Um, and when I read it and I saw the potential of, of presenting it, I... I realized I couldn't pass this up.
Um, it doesn't matter how far you get. You could go through part three and whatever. But so what? I mean, if you don't understand this, then what good is it? But if you understand this, you don't need to go to part three. Okay, so we'll finish. Thank you all for coming again. Um, and uh, you all, please also have a good evening. And uh, I'll send all my blessings to you and your family. Stay safe, you know, um, and just help others in any way you can. Don't be stingy with your time, okay? And to all of those who have helped me in so many different ways, um, and even sometimes just showing up for class helps me. I I really um, I thank you all with it, with all sincerity and the deepness of my heart, um, because this is what we do. Amitofo, take care. Thank you, Gilbert. Thank you, Gilbert. Thank you. Thank you, Gilbert. Thank you, Gilbert. Gilbert. You're welcome. Thank you, Gilbert.